Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where it's a pretty slow week. What's going on? I mean, it is raining trailers, right? Well, it's a little gathering called CinemaCon. CinemaCon is not open to the public. It's where the studios impress the uh, theater owners of their upcoming slates, being like, you better book a lot of theaters for this movie, because it's going to be big. There's been a lot of uh, strutting around. For instance, Tom Rothman, when he showed uh, Blade Runner footage, was like, Netflix my ass. Uh, and it's like, don't lose your cool, Tom Rothman. Don't show, uh, and don't let anyone know that Netflix is making you sweat, right? You should be like, do a Don Draper. I don't even think about Netflix. One of my favorite disses from Don Draper ever uh where some uh it was that um copywriter guy uh he came and he's from superstore now and he was in the elevator and he said to don draper i like i hate you or something or i think you're horrible and don draper's like really i don't think about you at all and it was amazing it was the best burn ever don draper so cool although he kind of ruined john ham's career afterwards which is too bad if you see john ham's um tax commercials he's really talented uh, and hopefully baby driver will help him out but anyway Back to CinemaCon, the press also has now started to attend because they're showing off so many, uh, you know, footage and trailers, etc. And in some cases, full movies. Uh, now, uh, headlines have been coming uh, coming out slowly from uh, CinemaCon, uh, and Disney has managed to make quite a number of headlines, even though they didn't really have much of a presentation. They only had about a 12-minute presentation because they decided to use their time to show everybody the entire Pirates of the Caribbean movie that's coming out, of course, for Memorial Day weekend. Pirates uh, 5, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Uh, but they do go to CinemaCon. <laughs> and the reaction seemed positive. So, uh, you know, it wasn't like people didn't take the internet to the internet and go, oh my God, you know, the game has changed. But they were like, oh, that was very pleasant and I enjoyed it. So uh, good for pirates, but also good for Baywatch, which of course is going up against it. They had some crazy headlines come out of CinemaCon where they were like, um, apparently like corpse penis jokes. And you're just like, ah, Dwayne Johnson, does anybody edit you? Like, I hope this, I hope they don't go too far. So anyway, the two Disney headlines that I want to talk about today, this is a little bit of a meandering episode. Thanks for sticking with me here. But the first, of course, is that uh, Disney has given a title to their Wreck-It Ralph sequel called Ralph Breaks the Internet. I wish it was like Ralph Breaks the Internets. That would be hilarious. Uh, and of course, having Ralph go on the internet was one of my suggestions for uh, Wreck-It Ralph 2. And I'll put a link to that video at the end of, uh, in the bottom, uh, in the video description and also at the end. Uh, with the poster frames. So anyway, uh, and I'll remember to do it. I'm getting better at that. Uh, so so anyway, uh, they call it Ralph Breaks the Internet. They had like a graphic that came out that was just basically like a, when your app updates, right? If, I think particularly if you have an iPhone or an iPad, and Disney, of course, has a wonderful relationship with Apple. Steve Jobs sat on the board after they acquired Pixar. Uh, but I thought, you know, I would have liked to have seen a character or something. I thought, you know, I kept being like, oh, maybe I don't have the sound turned up. There was no sound. It was you know, kind of silly and ridiculous. But anyway, they talked a little bit about the movie, and they said that Jane Lynch and Jack McBrayer will also return alongside John C. Riley and Sarah Silverman, uh, and that they're going to continue to focus on Ralph and Vanellope's friendship, two former outcasts who found each other and true friendship, true friendship. And I think that actually works really well at the internet because one of the best things about the internet is that it broadens everybody's world. You're able to meet so many more people. I'm able to talk to all of you about movies uh, across the globe. Uh, and I think that that would be great to, to show how, you know, it widens people's horizons and experiences. Uh, and also you might think, well, the, isn't the internet a huge, you know, a huge thing for you to, to, to tackle Disney animation? Well, I think that Rich Moore proved with Zootopia that he's capable of handling a very dense and rich world and, and doing so, you know, with, with the tremendous success. Uh, he's going to be, of course, returning, uh, as is a number of members of his team that also worked on Zootopia, but not Byron Howard, who, of course, was just recently quoted in that lawsuit against Zootopia, uh, you know, against Disney for stealing Zootopia. He was the opening quote about how, you know, if you copy something, it's okay because it filters through you. So I think Byron Howard might be benched for a little bit over at Disney. We'll see. So that's the that's the first story of the day. I'm curious, what do you think of the title, Ralph Breaks the Internet? Are you excited about Wreck-It Ralph 2? They said there'll be new characters as well. Uh, I'm very excited. You know, it's like, um, it's like just a done deal. You're like, yeah, I'll see it. Uh, so I think that the next step is 
the real they'll start to really get buzz going. I think once they have new characters or if these old former characters are wearing something new, like, like uh, if they get reskinned to use uh, digital terminology, uh, and then also you know starting to see some new characters and how they're going to depict the internet. But then here's a really interesting thing. One of you sent me this photo uh, from you know from CinemaCon, and they have their their slate of movies coming up at Disney. Oh, and you can see they've totally done away with small films. They're not even going to try anymore. They're like, yeah, we got burned real bad by Finest Hours and Queen of Cotway, which is a shame because they're both excellent movies. But they're like, we're not doing that anymore. But you pointed out, this BTC viewer pointed out to me that they still have an untitled live action fairy tale movie for summer 2017. What? How is that possible? Is there a surprise one coming out? That's less than a year away. How can that, uh, they can still be using that as a placeholder? I don't know what's going on there. That's really weird. Uh, they have another one you can see in summer 2018. Uh, that's actually an August date. I believe that that is Aladdin. Uh, but there are a couple of cool logos that are worth taking a quick look at here. Uh, you know, you can see Wrinkle in Time. I think that looks very pretty with the, with the hands of a clock. I think that's neat. Uh, I think that you've got Ant-Man and the Wasp. Oh, I think they should just call it Ant-Man and Wasp, quite frankly. And also, Wasp looks bigger than Ant-Man. So I think that's funny. But I, I think Evangeline Lilly is just fabulous in that role. Can't wait for that movie. And it, of course, will be, you know, the first female... Um, Marvel superhero to be in the title of a movie. You know, you have Captain Marvel coming there down the down the pipeline, but Wasp beats her. She she beats her to the punch. Uh, and then Mulan. You can see the Mulan logo there. That's pretty generic. I don't wouldn't be surprised if that changes. I think that's just like you know it's like you know they're like you get an idea for what's going there. So uh, that's a that's a really beautiful slate of uh, of movies. I think it looks really good. And I wonder what they'll call the uh, Han Solo film eventually. Uh, apparently he's not even officially called Han Solo. They had that, that big brouhaha where they were like, that's not his real name. And everyone was like, why can't it be? That's an unnecessary complication, Disney. Be careful. Tread carefully with the, uh, you know your Star Wars uh, new toys. All right, so anyway, those are the Disney stories. And I'd be curious uh, what, you, what your thoughts are on that and the headlines they made at CinemaCon. Uh, then also another story worth discussing is premium video on demand. You know, uh, that was a, that's something that's being talked a lot about at CinemaCon because of course it's where the studios and the distrib and the, uh, the I mean the studio dis distributors and the theatrical companies come together. They're the ones who have to make this deal. Uh, and you know last year Screening Room was at uh, CinemaCon and they were like really pushing. That's the Sean Parker uh, enterprise. You know the guy who helped with Facebook and he really wanted to, to launch Screening Room to be a cons consumer premium VOD service uh, and everyone laughed at him and, or got scared and got angry and a lot of filmmakers came out and were like this is horrible well this year everyone's talking about it quite seriously uh, and to the point that they expect an announcement by the end of the year now they've had premium video on demand services for quite some time for the super wealthy. I think it's like five hundred dollars a movie or something. So uh, you know that's how movie stars, etc. If they don't get it from the studio, they don't have a connection. They can watch movies in their home screening rooms. I think that's a ridiculous amount of money to pay. How much do you hate? Uh, going to the theater if you have to see a movie right now and can't wait the 90 day window which is traditional 90 days from theatrical release to streaming release uh, and they cheat a little bit with Apple because it's available like two or three weeks in advance if you buy it oh I bought so many movies that I otherwise never would have purchased but I needed something to watch uh, and I also just didn't want to wait all right so and also it's cheaper you know if you get a couple of people together it's cheaper than going to the movie anyway so these are the two frontrunner plans uh, Universal would like to charge you $40 for the movie uh, to rent it after 10 days of uh, it being in the in the theater. So 10 days after its theatrical release, you can get it at home for $40, probably for like a 24-hour rental. Warner Brothers, uh, which by the way is supposedly going to be purchased by AT&T, there's buzz that Trump might kill that deal. Uh, but AT&T, of course, is a digital company, and they would love a premium video on demand service to work out, and that's probably one of the main reasons they wanted to purchase Warner Brothers, because uh, that'll be a huge source of revenue. If this goes through, and I think it will, it's going to just really change the movie industry. I think they're going to be surprised at how many people opt not to go to the movie theater because they're so dirty and difficult. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, I'm glad everybody in the rest of the world has a good time, but here in the States, it's becoming intolerable. Uh, and so something needs to give a swift kick in the butt to the theater companies to police their audiences. Um, I was in a theater, I was in a movie, I actually saw Beauty and the Beast for a second time, uh, and someone during the movie threw stuff on the audience from above, like candy. We didn't even know it was candy at first, and it really kind of took everybody out of the movie. Um, 
And then when I went to complain, they gave me my money because, you know, I didn't know who did it and they only did it once, so I couldn't report it. Uh, but when I went to complain afterwards, at first they thought, oh, they just was dirty and they didn't understand. They were like, we can't control how people act in the theater. Uh, and But, you know, eventually they gave me my money back. But, you know, you can see why it's a real problem. Uh, you get stuff thrown on you. So anyway, um, uh, Warner Brothers wants to do $50 after 17 days. I think that's too long. That's too long. What I would do is I would do the 10 days after release for $50. I would go up to the $50 price point because that's really close to release. That's less than two weeks after release. Uh, that's what I would do. I think anything else isn't worth it. You know, if you're waiting 17 days, I think at that point the, the urgency goes away and you might as well wait the 90 day window, right? Uh, but I think people want to see a movie when it comes out. There's a lot of online chatter. We'll talk about online chatter in a moment. Uh, and so I think that that's a real impetus. And I think when, especially for families, uh, $50 uh, or like groups of friends, even couples. When you think about the, you know, the to cost to go out and how you know difficult it is to be in the theater, uh, and also with 3D and premium seating anyway, you're already at fifty dollars for two people. So I think, I think they're gonna, I think they're gonna make a lot of money. But I think that I'm glad theaters are getting a cut of this of these of these prices because they're gonna lose a lot of customers. Uh, but I think theaters will just, then just go super high end. All right. So anyway, as for the viewer question, this comes from Rockstar. Rockstar with the C R O C Star. Uh, this is a great question. So Rockstar says, how does the industry make predictions for the box office? This particularly because they're usually pretty on the money, literally. So this is how it works. This is how they're able to predict how much a movie is going to make when it opens. And also it's drop. So the first thing they do, and they've been doing this for quite a long time, and so they're very good at it, is they track a movie. That's what they, what they do is they poll moviegoers, just like, you know, although of course in elections this hasn't been going so well, at least in the United States. But they poll like, a, they, they, they do a random group, they, they pick a random group of people and they poll them for their interest in a movie. And they'll say, like, well, how likely do you think you're going to see this movie? You know, definitely, maybe, probably not, definitely not. And then they're dividing it up in terms of gender, et cetera, uh, age, demographic, uh, um, I mean, uh, location, geography, to really get a good idea of who's planning to see this movie. So that helps them. Also, there are box office patterns. When is the movie coming out? How do movies typically do on that release date? How does a franchise typically perform? Either the franchise itself, or if it's a new franchise that's being launched, similar franchises. How do actors do? As I've told you before, Ryan Gosling usually opens at around 11 million, consistently. It's nuts. Moviegoers are very, very consistent. Do, how much does a director usually open with? For instance, Christopher Nolan, you know, he would be factored in. How does the genre typically do if you're going to do fairy tales, Disney and non-Disney? Uh, that's what's something they're going to look at. Then also they're going to want to know about social media buzz in terms of how much, how, what's going on with Twitter, what's going on with Instagram, and also now trailer views. How many people are watching the trailer? How big is it? Now Fandango also can do pre-release uh, you know, they can tell you how many tickets are being sold in advance and they can, uh, I, don't, they don't, I don't know if they give it to the studio, but they don't make it public how many tickets they've sold in advance, but they will tell you what movie it's aligned with. Like, for instance, you might recall they were saying that Beauty and the Beast was outpacing Finding Dory. So the industry is able to go, okay, Finding Dory opened at 135. So if Beauty and the Beast is selling more tickets in advance than Finding Dory did, it stands to reason, obviously, that it'll open bigger than 135. Uh, and then they say, start to say, well, it's performing like a superhero movie. You might remember that Fandango floated out that line. Great line. Uh, and then so the industry can go, okay, well, what, is, what do superhero movies typically open at? And that's how, you, that's how you can get the number. That's how you can gauge the number. It's very interesting. It's a couple of different uh, factors. But as you can see, they're, they're very good at it. Uh, and also moviegoers are incredibly predictable you know people people have the things that they like and they have their viewing habits and that's and they they very rarely break them but if they are going to break them you can tell by the other factors like social media buzz trailer views pre-ticket sales and you know tracking as well so uh, i hope that uh, clarifies that for you rockstar great question thank you everybody for tuning in today please write down below you think today's top three stories rockstar's viewer question anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions of course that you might have thanks for watching bye